When I was four years old, my father died. He was young and actually very fit, um, but he got a terrible cancer, and within a few weeks, he was dead. And that just left me uh, and my mother. And it was, it was a terrible time. Uh, we had to move house to a much smaller house. We had to move to someplace else where we didn't know anybody. It was winter. Uh, we both got sick, and it was really just the worst time. But you know, what was the worst bit was not all of the things that happened to our lives, but the worst bit was me seeing how sad my mother was. I'd never seen an adult's emotion before. I remember just before my father died, my mother and father talking to each other in the, in the bedroom, and, and they were absolutely just weeping their eyes out, and I couldn't understand why they were so sad, and, and that such a thing, an adult could feel such a, a, a sadness emotion. And I suppose at that point, I realized that all I wanted to do, all I wanted to do was make my mother happy. So we started to rebuild our lives. I went to school, uh, worked pretty hard. I did okay in the exams. I got to university, uh, I went to medical school, and I graduated as a doctor. <laughs> Don't you hate those pictures? <laughs> They're, but you know, it's an embarrassing picture. But you know what? That was the happiest day of my mother's life. The fact that I had graduated as a doctor made her the happiest, happiest person I've ever seen. And that made me feel happy. And guys, there's nothing better you can do in your life than to make somebody happy. It's the best thing. And um, my mother actually lived a very long time after that. She had a very long and happy life. Um, and when she eventually died, I went round to clear her house and I was looking at all the pictures. And there were no pictures of my father anywhere because I suppose that would have made her sad. But that picture was next to her bed. And I knew she'd been happy for that all her life. So that was medical school. And I finished as a doctor. And I thought, well, now what? So I knew what I really didn't want to do was I didn't want to be the establishment doctor. I didn't want to go and do the conventional training of being a GP or a pediatrician or a surgeon. I wanted to do something my way. Uh, I wanted to have a bit of an adventure. I wanted to travel. So I decided what I was going to do was I was going to get a job in a tropical island as a doctor. Very good. So I went and talked to some of my colleagues and said, what do you think about that idea? And I talked to some of the professors, and they all said, you're crazy. Don't do that. You know, you'll, get, you'll lose touch. You'll never get a job when you come back. You've got this great career in front of you in Edinburgh. So when somebody tells you you shouldn't do something, what do you do? Of course, I was even more determined to do it. So uh, applying for a job as a doctor on a tropical island, how does that work? So you go on the internet and type Google, go into Google and type jobs for doctors in tropical islands. Actually, there was no internet. Did you pick up your mobile phone and ring ministers of health and say, can I have a job? No mo mobile phones. Facebook, maybe. Mark Zuckerberg wasn't born. His dad was still a student. No. Uh, what I did was I got an atlas out and looked through all the pages, and I spotted all the islands that I liked the sound of, and I wrote letters. Dear Minister of Health, Government of Dominica. Dear Minister of Health, Government of Galapagos Islands. Can I have a job, please? Uh, and I got lots of letters back, amazingly. Uh, most of them didn't really say anything, but one of them offered me a job. And I thought, amazing. I've done it. I've done it. I'm going to be a doctor in a tropical island. It was the government... It was Dominica, which is a small island uh, in the Caribbean. So I was just so happy, so happy. I was going to live my dream, so I got on the plane and went to Dominica. I didn't fly the plane, by the way, but uh, and I, I was on top of the world. I'd done it. I'd beaten the establishment. I was going to live my dream. Disaster. No job. No job. The island was in the grip of general strike. It had been on strike for weeks. All the public services had closed down. There was absolutely no prospect of a job whatsoever. So here I am, 
uh, I'm in an island, I've got no job, uh, no money, uh, and no place to live. Uh, and I'm feeling a bit stupid about at this point, you know? I've left behind all this, you know, stuff uh, in Edinburgh. And then I thought, what would your mother say at this point? And she either said, stick with it, son. Don't give up. So I didn't. Uh, so I talked to a few people, and I thought, there must be other islands where there are jobs. And right enough, somebody said, yeah, there's a great island just next door called St. Lucia. They might have a job. Why don't you, try, why don't you ring them up? Now, there were phones in the Caribbean in those days, but most of the time they didn't work. But I thought I'd try anyway. So I got a phone. I borrowed somebody's phone, and it's one of those phones. So you I picked it up and it rang. Amazing. I got through to the Ministry of Health in St. Lucia and I said, can I speak to the Minister of Health? And he said, speaking. <laughs> and I said, hello, I'm a doctor. I'm in the island next door, can I have a job? And he said, sure, start tomorrow. Well, hey, I couldn't believe it. My dream was going to come true after all. I'd done it my way. I was going to be a doctor in a remote tropical uh, island. Amazing. So I stayed in St. Lucia for two and a half years. And I can tell you that it completely transformed my whole way of thinking. Everything that I'd learned in medical school suddenly became so different a perspective. I realized that, you know, what you learn in medical school, patients, treatments, hospitals, is only a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of what actually really makes people well and what makes people ill. People are People's health is influenced by the environment in which th they live in, their lifestyle, what they eat. So many different things that are nothing to do with that little narrow, narrow framework of doctors where we can make a tiny little bit of difference. But the other thing I learned is that you can do amazing things with no resources, almost no resources. And I'll, I'll give you an example of that. One night I was working in the hospital and there was a terrible road accident and lots of people came in, in, in injured. And there was one guy in particular who was really, really badly injured. He was, he was going to die. He had lost several pints of blood. He urgently needed a blood transfusion. So imagine, I'm in paradise. Palm trees, beaches, beautiful weather. But actually, I'm in hell. I'm in hell because I'm in, I have a patient in front of me. I'm in a hospital where there's no intensive care no operating theater, almost no drugs, and definitely no blood. This guy's going to die. What am I going to do? So I thought about it. Now, at that time in the Caribbean, really the only reliable communication method is the radio. Everybody listened to the radio. So I went to the radio station and I said, I need your help. I need to take over your radio station for a bit. So I got onto the radio and I said, hi. This is Norman here. There's a guy who needs your help. He needs a blood transfusion, and he needs it now. Can I have your help, please? And what happened over the next few hours was just quite remarkable. They came. People came in their dozens in the middle of the night, walked miles to the hospital to give their blood to save somebody's life, who they, most of them didn't even know. And eventually, with a lot of testing and cross-matching, I found enough blood to save his life. And I can tell you, money can't buy what that feels like. To save somebody's life is the most amazing thing, and especially with the will and the kindness of the people of St. Lucia. Unbelievable. So I spent two and a half years there, and I came back, and I came back to live in, in London, actually. I was a very different person, a very different sort of doctor. I wasn't ever going to be then like a normal doctor. I didn't quite know what sort of doctor I was going to be, but I knew I wasn't going to be a normal one. And then one day I discovered it. I discovered what I wanted to do. I went to an institution, a building, and inside this building there were a lot of detectives, Sherlock Holmes. But they weren't criminal detectives. These were doctor detectives, medical detectives. This was the center where doctors investigated epidemics, epidemics of infectious diseases all across the country, tuberculosis, AIDS, 
whooping cough, meningitis. I was fascinated. And I knew right then and there that that's where I wanted to work. That's where I had to work. Um, the only problem was they didn't have a job. But hey, that's not a problem. Uh, so what I did was I just kept sort of showing up there. I used to go to their lunchtime meetings and I'd go to all the lectures and I'd go and have lunch there. And I thought maybe eventually th they'll think I work here. Uh, and eventually, I think they did, uh, they did take pity on me. They said, OK, we better give them a job then. So, so I got a job there. And it was, it was the coolest job ever, uh, investigating all these outbreaks, tracing where they came from, what was the source, who was transmitting it from person to person, how could you interrupt the transmission, uh, what could you to do to prevent it happening in the first place. And I got, I got particularly interested in vaccination. Amazing. You can give somebody an injection and protect them for life. That just blew my mind away. I got, I got totally passionate about uh, uh, vaccines. And at that time in the UK, there was a huge epidemic of meningitis. Uh, I mean, this is a really scary disease. Uh, there were over a thousand cases occurring, totally unpredictable. They would suddenly cause epidemics in schools, in universities. People either die or are left very severely disabled. Uh, a really terrifying disease. And there was really no way of preventing it. But I knew that the way to do it, only way to do it in the long term, was to have a vaccination against it. So I went to the government and I persuaded them to give me quite a lot of money to do research on meningitis. And I went to several drug companies and I persuaded them to focus their efforts on making a vaccine that I could do research in. And for the next several years, I worked on meningitis vaccine. And in 1999, the UK became the first country in the world to vaccinate all its children against meningitis. <sighs> I can't tell you what that felt like. Hundreds of deaths and thousands of cases would no longer happen of meningitis in the UK. And over the next few years, many other countries in the world have implemented this meningitis vaccine. And that has just been the most incredible feeling for me to be part of that. And, and basically, uh, that's what I do. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a vaccine nerd. And all I think about is vaccination and what it can do to save lives. And I'm just so happy to have had the opportunity to have worked on that uh, meningitis vaccine. So I, I've talked a bit about, you know, what it feels like to help other people. But then something happened to me not so long ago where somebody actually transformed my life for me. Um, I woke up one morning and I had a pain in my leg, just a little bit of a stiff pain. I thought, oh, I've pulled the muscle in the gym. It'll be fine. So what do doctors do when they've got symptoms? Do they go to the doctor? No. They are the worst patients in the world. I ignored it for a year. And then I thought, oh dear, I suppose I better go and see a doctor then. Anyway, it turns out that I had arthritis of the hip. And the surgeon told me, 75% of your hip joint is missing. It's going to get worse. And the only thing we can do is to have a total hip replacement. So a year ago, on the 25th of January 2016, I had a hip replacement. And I remember waking up in the morning, and I had no pain. Before this, I, could, I couldn't sleep at night for the pain. I could hardly walk 100 yards without having to stop. Now, with a lot of effort, I was able to get fit and get back my motivation. That surgeon totally transformed my life. That made me so happy. But then something truly, truly amazing happened. I was at work on my email on the internet, and I suddenly saw this advertisement. Wanted volunteers to climb and trek up Mount Kenya. That's Mount Kenya. Uh, it's the second highest mountain in Africa. It's about 5,000 meters tall. And this was a call for people who worked where I work to come and join a trek to climb up Mount Kenya and actually also to raise money for charity. So I went online, this time online application, no writing letters to government of St. Lucia, filled in an application and sent it off and forgot about it. Three weeks later, I got an e email saying, you're going on the trek. I couldn't believe it. I was so excited. I was so excited. My new hip has given me this lease, lease of life to enable me to try and climb up Mount Kenya. So in exactly eight days from now, I'm going to get on an aeroplane 
and I'm going to fly to Nairobi, and I'm going to join 40 other people, and I'm going to climb that thing. With <laughs> So that's kind of my talk's nearly done, but there's just one little last thing. You probably want to know why I'm called the rock and roll doctor. Just, just give me a second. 